Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we will start. Uh, this is a, the third uh, lecture that we have on this uh, difficult subject of religion and Canadian art. Uh, when I was contemplating this series of, of lecture, I thought it was obvious to, uh, to have one at least on Osias Le Duc uh, religious production. Some of you may recall last year or the year before, I spoke of his still life, I spoke of his uh, landscape, but never really of his religious production. And in fact, it was uh, most of his career, he was a church decorator. So I guess this, for him, was more important than the rest, in a way. Uh, but it's when I began to write about this, I said, oh my God, it's, it's really <laughs> complex and difficult. And uh, I will try to be as clear as possible. And I, I understand also that the, the religious picture, the iconography, let's say, of Ozias Le Duc, was done in a time uh, of high counter-reformation in the Catholic Church. Uh, and it, I would say it's, it's even violently as such, and uh, will certainly, uh, let's say, make on at ease some Protestant sensitivity, uh, because the way it's presented and the, the insistence in the dogma are very systematically anti-Protestant, I would say. Uh, not to mention anti-Jewish. No? I'm aware that last time when I tried to comment about the Hebrew words in a picture, you remember of Frère Luc, I may have uh, uh, touch some uh, Jewish sensitivity. Believe me, it was not voluntarily, but uh, it shows how these matters are complex, are rooted deep back in history, and uh, you know, we are still relevant today uh, because it, it goes or to our childhood or to our actual belief and all that, and, and it's always a little bit difficult to uh, to sort all this. Okay, the first thing I want, I will make few remarks, and then we will start uh, with the with the slides with the picture. The, the first remark, you remember, I, I says that you, you could say that there was a kind of two movement uh, in this religious approach that we had, that we have seen last, year, uh, last uh, time, last week. Uh, there was, in a way, a tendency to separate two spheres, uh, the sphere of the human down and the sphere of the divine up. Uh, and in the first painting I show you of the... Uh, how France b brought faith to the Euron people, it was very clear. You had a, a scene in heaven, and then it was repeated in a painting, and that way they showed clearly, let's say, the separation between both. But right away you have another tendency where I would say the divine seems to be closer to us. For instance, these little ex voto that I show you, uh, Saint Anne is not represented in a painting. She's like there, like assisting to uh, these poor people with their trouble and trying to save them. Uh, uh, so you have these two movements. There's one of separation, if you want, and the other, of course, uh, in the country of the rapprochement. Uh, but even in, when they want to express this rapprochement, they want to save a little bit the transcendence of this divine creature. Uh, for instance, Saint Anne was circled by a little uh, belt of clouds, let's say, to, to separate her from our world. Uh, like uh, also, you remember, I, I commented about the angel, the guardian angel. I, even when they go back to the story in the Bible, they never go as far as not to put him with wings. Uh, even Rambra, uh, who was the more realistic one, who make uh, an angel so sweet and so believable that he, even without, <laughs> without this wings, he will be perfectly okay. But no, he maintained that because, again, okay, you may speak of a rapprochement between the divine and the human, but you have to save some, uh, some aspect of transcendence. And why it's so important in, in, in terms of the, I would say, the Christian uh, sensitivity, all this, it, it is because Christians believe in the incarnation of God. Uh, this is the first dogma, that uh, the Son of God came in human shape. Uh, so then, of course, you collapse uh, the divine with the human. And one of the problems is how to maintain that distance. Uh, uh, when you believe in the incarnation of God. So this is the first, the first problem. The other problem is the sacrifice. Uh, but this incarnated God not only uh, 
appear on human form, but also is sacrificed. At the end, he, he, he got killed and, uh, on the cross and then resurrected and all this. So this belief also is important. And when you think of what it is to sacrifice, if you go back, to, let's say, to uh, the religion of antiquity, for instance, to sacrifice basically is to put aside something, it could be an animal, it could be part of an animal, it could be some object, for the usage of the gods. Uh, when it's sacred, when it's declared sacrifice, it is, that means it's out of common usage. You cannot use it anymore. And profanation is exactly the opposite. You take something that was reserved for the god, and now you put it in, in, in regular usage. Everybody can use it. Now it's profanated. It's no more sacred. Yeah? Okay, so, th so that you have these two things. You have the incarnation on one hand, and then you have this idea of sacrifice. But then you get a kind of mixture because, in a way, if Jesus is God, uh, how can he sacrifice himself? How can he put him inside, aside for God himself? Uh? You remember, so th that's one of the conflicts. The other, of course, it is uh, if he really wants to be God, why to sacrifice himself? Uh? We should sacrifice to him and all that. It's a, you, you see the, the kind of dilemma. I may look very far from Ozias Le Duc with this, but in fact, I think I'm at the very core of the problem. The problem of Ozias Le Duc as a painter will be always that. How to suggest divinity in humanity or the opposite? How to suggest humanity when I represent divine figure? And the balance is always difficult in Christianity. It's always, uh, and that's why I think you, you, f you, you could have sensitivity goes in one direction and in one, and others in other direction, this balance has always been difficult. And the solution for an artist, of course, to, to solve the problem is the symbol. Uh, a symbol is a way to speak of the divine, which we, is invisible, it's difficult to reach, uh, through a, uh, let's say, a visible form. Uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, Ozias uh, Ledit uh, will be very much uh, involved in this symbolism and you will be very interested by this aspect and you will see how from painting to painting how you try to solve the, uh, the, this problem. How to divinize if you want the human or how to humanize the divine. Huh? So it's exactly the, 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 the crux of the matter. This is why also that uh, maybe I just indulge in a little bit of theology here. This is why also the father of the churches, of the church in the 4th, 5th century, insisted very much on the, this kind of doctrine which is called the homo osia. I will explain to you, if I can, <laughs> a little bit what it is. Homo osia in, gre in Greek means, homo means the same, and osia, substance. Huh? This was the insistence that the Son of God and God is of the same substance. Huh? And it was not clear to everybody at, at, uh, at the time. You have, uh, for instance, a priest who was called Arius, who thought, okay, they are similar, but they are not identical. Uh, and uh, many, uh, many uh, people of the Eastern Church, let's say, have been Arianist in that sense. They say, okay, Jesus is, is similar to God, but he's not God. Uh, there, there is a, a distinction there. And in the in the Latin tradition, in the contrary, uh, you have this doctrine of homus usia, meaning that the two are similar in substance. Uh, that's what basically what, what they, they use. And you have the same reasoning also with the uh, so-called transubstantiation. I remember we, uh, we used this uh, very hard word when we were a kid and we tried to repeat it. Well, basically what it means is that the host during the high mass is not a representation of Christ, it's not uh, a symbol or just a sign, it is Christ himself. Huh? And it's, it's always the same type, this is the, I would say, the reaction of theologian and of doctor of the church against the, the, the tendency of Christianity to go in the other direction. Huh? When you humanize the divine, you put it closer to you, you multiply the symbol uh, of, uh, of, of his humanity and all that. And, and let's say the, the, uh, the magister, or, or the one who, who defined the dogma, will resist to that. Will say, well, be careful, don't go too far in that direction. After all, we are speaking of God, we are speaking of something transcendent, different from us. And, and you see, so, you know, this is exactly the type of problem in which uh, the iconography of uh, Ozias Sadiq we will have to deal with. 
I will proceed. I will show you a few examples of his work because he, he worked all his all his life uh, on these themes, and uh, he, he died very old. So there's a lot of churches who have been illustrated by him. There's one that has been restored recently, and it's close to Montreal. It's in Joliet, and it's a parish. It's called Saint Charles Borromeo, and uh, since 1905, I think the uh, the church has been uh, named a cathedral. And uh, recently, they have restored a painting uh, that are on the ceiling. Uh, you see one example here, and I put aside a little detail of uh, the little putty there, uh, one, the little angels uh, on the side. And of course, it's a representation of the Assumption of the Blessed uh, Virgin Mary. The program of Le Duc there is relatively simple to understand. It's based on the uh, so-called Mysteries of the Rosary. Uh, uh, for people who doesn't know what is the rosary, it's a kind of uh, uh, a way to say prayers, I would say it's with beads and you go like this. But what is important in this rosary business, it is uh, very much the, the glory of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and because of that, you could see during the Contour Reformation period, it was very popular among the Catholic. It was a way to... To, to say to the Protestant, you, you see, we believe in Mary much more than you. You, you don't uh, pay uh, the same uh, the respect to her like we do and all this. And for instance, the dogma of Assumption is a very recent one. It was uh, defined by Pius XII in 1950. So it's, it's, it was traditional in the church, I see, to believe that after death, the Virgin was uh, carried like this in heaven, like you see here. And, and so it's a kind of traditional type of belief, but it was not a dogma until uh, Pius XII decided uh, to make one. Of course, you have no basis whatsoever in scriptures. It's uh, just traditional belief. It's, uh, why not? Say one went to heaven already, why not two? You know, that <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I think it's very difficult to, to justify completely. But anyway, that, that was the... Uh, the city attitude. So the, the since he, he took that as uh, since Jose Sadik took that as a as a team, let's say, uh, he had all the, the these famous glorious mysteries, let's say, of the Rosary, and he passed all of them. You know, so so when you go there and you look at the ceiling of the church, you see uh, example of each one in in, in this type of uh, surrounding. In this case. We, we know a little bit how he proceeds, uh, which are his, his sources, let's see. You have a little drawing on the left that he did, and then uh, a famous picture of Tiziano uh, that uh, certainly is the source of inspiration. Okay, he suppressed uh, all the apostles uh, uh, in, the, in the bottom of the picture, and also got the father on the top here and uh, reduce uh, this chorus of little, angel, little angels to only two with a crown. But if you remember the, the actual painting, even this uh, detail has uh, been uh, suppressed, uh, as if he start from a very famous model and then reduce it to his uh, usage uh, there. Uh, the color is about the same like in the Tiziano, so you must have seen uh, some reproduction of it. I, I'm sure he was not uh, uh, going in Rome to see it and all that, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the source is evidently uh, there. I, I, I just want to read a, a beautiful uh, phrases of Berenson, who is uh, one of the great art historians, let's say an amateur of art and all that, uh, about the Tiziano, of course, not about the Osias to do. He says, in the Assunta, for example, the Virgin soars heavenward and not helpless in the arms of angels, but borne up by the fullness of life within her, and by the feeling that the universe is naturally her own, and that nothing can check her course. I, I think it's a good description of the Tiziano, uh, the way uh, Berenson saw it. Huh? Uh, so uh, Le Duc was very much aware that uh, his composition was not original, huh? and he said so. He, he wrote that uh, what he wanted to do is to take uh, model in, the, in great artists, and it's one of his very uh, early uh, works. So I guess as a young man, he didn't want to take too much risk. So he says, I took my model with great artists. He says, the only invention I tried to do is to harmonize the color of all of that. Of course, when you work uh, on 15 teams, they said differently in the same church, you have a problem, of course, of organizing the color 
uh, of it, and he did, th this is, will be his contribution here. Uh, uh, this is another uh, example of the same, uh, related to the same church, except that here you don't have the actual painting, but rather a sketch uh, that uh, prepare a view of the resurrection. And if you notice, uh, we see a little bit uh, this kind of square lines uh, that uh, is used by painters when they want to inflate uh, their design. That's what we call a miso caro, uh, in which you, you put these squares uh, on, on a drawing and then you could uh, enlarge it as much as you want when you are on the wall. So this is a study uh, of, uh, of uh, the resurrection. Uh, in a way, what uh, uh, Ludwig did here, it's a kind of synthesis of many texts. Uh, as you know, the real witness of the resurrection of Christ are, uh, are the soldiers who were supposed to be there to guard that nothing of that kind will happen. Uh, so they were sleeping, apparently, and then suddenly they, uh, they lose track of him, and he was, he was no more in the tomb and all that. Uh, this, is, this is what the scripture tells us. And then after, the day after, the two uh, holy women, the, uh, Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, uh, the mother of, of James, came to, to see what happened, and then they saw the angel. Uh, but Christ was no more there. So it's a kind of synthesis, if you want, of two different texts in the Gospel that uh, is quite traditional, that you find very often uh, in, in the tradition, and that uh, uh, Uziah Savik tried to do. So what you see you have here the, the soldier who are uh, put a, uh, say a back completely, falling on the ground on one end, and here you have Mary Magdalena on the other side, and the angel who is sitting here on a kind of square uh, stone. Uh, the gospel mentioned that he rolled the stone, so normally it should be wrong, it should not be square like this. And, and Christ is already uh, anti gravitational, you know, he's uh, going uh, like this. It's a way to, to show also this idea of, uh, of, say, when I was speaking of divinization of the human, uh, one of the things that make us human, of course, is our weight, uh, especially me. <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, to be without weight, it's a way to, to suggest that. Uh, but all this is, uh, is quite traditional also uh, in this. Uh, so this is another of the decor of Joliet uh, that you could see if you go there. It has been recently restored, and I just want to make a little party with very, very uh, different uh, work, like Piero de la Francesca, for instance, uh, when he treat the resurrection, I think he did it closer to the text of the Gospel, uh, because what you see is only the soldier, and Christ putting his feet, let's say, uh, on the, the edge of the tomb and getting out like this. And he make also in the background a kind of position between uh, a dead tree and a living one uh, as a kind of a suggestion of the passage from death to, to life. Uh, and uh, traditionally, uh, people, uh, well, art historians think that the face of this sleeping guy there was the face of Piero La Francesca himself. Uh, but, but here, you see, in the tradition, let's see, in the, uh, in the Renaissance, you have a painter probably wanted to be closer to the text uh, than Aurelius did. And in, in between, of course, you have centuries of, uh, of reass reassessing this type of image and transforming them as we know them now. Uh, just at a part, it's about the restoration of these, uh, of these uh, 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 pi pictures in Joliet. They were done by a firm who's called uh, Le Gris uh, Conservation, or whatever. And uh, among the painters who worked for them and to restore, let's see, the color, of, uh, because it was quite fade out and it was also very dirty at certain times, one of the problems with Catholic Church is you have a lot of uh, wax burning there, and, and wax makes a lot of, uh, say, all the candles that they are there, it's a dirt, the picture with time, especially if they are varnished, and then it's, it's stick in the varnish, and it, you have to clean this after. And one of the painters who was uh, uh, working with them was Guy Pellerin, and Pellerin is known as a kind of very abstract painter of, uh, of uh, today. He's a young man, and, he, and habitually his presentations are done like this. It's, it's just monochrome uh, picture. You have only one color on each one, and they are installed. He will make, for instance, a little uh, 
shelves here and we put all of the fur that we just saw before. Uh, now, Pedro is a kind of interesting fellow, but uh, very, uh, very different uh, uh, type of, of work, of course. The second uh, church that I wanted to mention, decorated by Rosia Sodi, is the Church of Saint Hilaire. Uh, and Saint Hilaire, as you know, well, it's, uh, it's uh, now a place near Montreal, about 40 kilometers from here, and uh, it's the birthplace of uh, both uh, uh, Bordeaux, uh, who was a uh, a pupil of Ozia Sadiq for a while, and of Ozia Sadiq, of course. Uh, this is the little, uh, uh, a little painting done by Baudouin that shows you the church that I want to show you after. Um, he painted that in 1933, so that means exactly after his return from France, you know, that Baudouin went for a few years, uh, two years and a few months, uh, in France to study sacred art uh, with Maurice Denis. Uh, uh, this is the less likely thing that could happen in the life of Bordeaux because after he quit the, the church, he quit the religion and everything, become an atheist, uh, whatever, and wrote, as you know, the famous uh, Refus Global, the, uh, uh, the manifesto against the church, in fact, against uh, the nationalism of the time. It was very, very hard. And, but in, in Turkey, of course, this is his village, and he, he says that... Uh, the, the picture of Ozia Sadiq in this little church was very important for, it, for him. Uh, it's a text that he wrote about the time, in almost uh, one year before the death of Le Duc. Le Duc saw that text and he says, Merci, Paulimine, for les gentils mots que vous avez dit sur moi, etc. We have a little letter of, of him. And what, what Baudouin says about this church, he says, I already knew about this painting through the tiny church of Saint Hilaire, which he had profusely decorated. Rated. From my birth until the age of 15, these were the only pictures that I ever saw. You cannot imagine my pride in having experienced this unique source of pictorial poetry at a time when the smallest impression of their mark and decide the direction our critical sense will take without our knowing it. Uh, this is very... Uh, it's hard to believe, but, but this is the condition of many, many young artists in Quebec at, at the time. You know, the only experience of real painting was not in a museum, of course, was in churches. Huh? And in, in the case of Bordeaux, the fact that this little church was decorated by Ozia Sadiq was very important because he became a student, he followed him everywhere, and uh, so. And here you have the facade of the church uh, of Saint Hilaire which is a little bit bizarre because it's much bigger than the church behind. If you look on the side here, that it's a little bit like uh, the system of uh, some, uh, in Texas you will have that, <laughs> kind of a, a garage with a huge facade and behind there's almost nothing. But, and then in this picture of uh, Uzia Sudik, you see, uh, it's called Mater Amabilis, of the lovable mother, if you want, and of course it's the Virgin Mary here who, at, who are looking at um, a good uh, wife with his li little baby, seems to be smiling, and, and then there's a kind of uh, little uh, path, let's say. The, the river you see there is the Richelieu, this is the church of saint Hilaire, and behind you have the North saint Hilaire with the uh, sugar loaf. Huh? The, the little spitz there <laughs> is the sugar loaf. Uh, and uh, so uh, Le Duc, uh, I've represented it. When you, you, you get in this church, you, you have really a, a surprise. I would say it's almost a baroque effect. Huh? You know, the baroque church are organized like that. From outside, they are very austere and uh, of Jesuit style, if you want. And then you get in and then, wow, then right away you are immersed in a kind of uh, incredible uh, world. Here, what is so uh, peculiar, it is that the style of this culture here, because everything is in wood there, is uh, in neo-Gothic style. And uh, of all side possible in this little uh, <laughs> environment, why to take the neo-Gothic style? And I, I remember uh, Gérard Morisset, who didn't like the neo-Gothic, uh, you know, Morisset is one of the first pioneer art historians here in Canada, he used to say, well, it is because of the influence of the Campbells. You know that in Saint Hilaire you have the uh, La Maison Campbell, the, the kind of the Castle Campbell, as it was called. It was the name, I think, of um, 
a sailor or something, a captain of ship and all that, and he built this big, big house. It was also occupied for a while by Jordi Bonnet, the sculptor, huh? and now I think it's a restaurant. I don't know what they do with it now, but anyway, it has changed many times. And the candles would have been the source of this idea of making the, the church in the style of neo-Gothic style, but it, it's probably not true. It's probably said be wanting to find it. Uh, a bad uh, 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 origin for it. In fact, what we know, it is that the, the vicar of the place was uh, well named Magloire La Flamme, with a name like this is wonderful. You will, uh, when he entered in his church, before this decoration was done, find the church very sad and very depressing, and he used like uh, to have a, a beautiful surrounding and all that, and he decided to put the money in this, and he says to attract the people who have neglected to come to church recently, I will make such a decor inside that everybody will come back to, to the church. And uh, he organized a team, he uh, asked uh, Uziah Sojik that you see here in this photo, with about 10 people around him, to paint the interior of the church and to execute all the, uh, uh, of the, the painting were there. Le Duc also got a commission to represent uh, Monsieur Laflamme himself. You see him there. Uh, he didn't like his portrait too much. Uh, why? He says, why you are so realistic? He says, <laughs> he, he says you hate me terribly because he says, I will be in a row of other portraits of that kind with priests. Say, Most of them doesn't reach even 60. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah. and Ludwig says, no, no, I cannot change it, it's over, i done it, and, and we will keep it that way. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, the idea of Ludwig, because it's not the first time that he does that, come from, he says, I wanted to leave from you an image you will last. Uh, if I show you too, yo too young, people will not even remember you like that way, so I show you a little bit, a little bit more older and then you will be remembered. And Curie Laflamme, uh, when, when he died uh, in, in the obit obituary, he says he was so prone to praise everybody and sometimes even himself. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. Well, he was a little bit, uh, to tell the truth, a little bit a vain man and like a para and like to all this uh, kind of beautiful decor and all this. Uh, uh, the, the, the theme of, of the church, of course, the first uh, painting that Ossias Le Duc had to do was a representation of Saint Hilaire himself, of the, of the bishop that he was called, after whom the church is called. Uh, this Saint Hilaire was a Frenchman, was from Poitiers, and is one of the doctors of the church. It has been uh, defined as such uh, in the 19th century. But what is interesting, and you will see why I was mentioning that in the beginning of my lecture, one of his treaties that he wrote was about the Trinity. And he was a staunch defensor of the homo Usia doctrine. Uh, he was against the Aryan, uh, Aryanites, and, uh, and he, he is known in the church for that. And this is exactly what uh, Le Duc has represented here. You see the bishop writing, he says, his treaties uh, on the, the Holy Trinity. Here you have a personification of faith uh, who seems to dictate uh, the content of the writing. And, of course, in heaven, you see the Trinity. You see uh, God the Father, uh, God the Son, and uh, the bird must be there, yeah, at the top somewhere, the dove, and uh, they, they are holding the globe, uh, they, they kind of, uh, uh, see, the, the way the, the relation with the world will be expressed that way. And uh, the, uh, the sweet things that um, Le Duc touched, if you want, it, uh, he, he made here a little uh, still life of books in the corner, and then on the other side also, kind of a still life with a, with a color lily, uh, nothing to do with, uh, I think the symbolism for him of the color was uh, something dealing with faith. It's a white flower, uh, beautiful, uh, a little bit like a lily, if you want. And uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, this is one of the cases where you can make a rapport between the uh, so-called uh, non-religious 
pipe of Le, Le Duc work and his strategic work. This little still life here in the corner relate, of course, to many of his still life done with, with books li like this one, huh? uh, like old books. Uh, uh, even the title seems to be evident. We, we, we have the impression we can read them, but it's impossible to read. They are just a kind of limitation. And then he put a kind of onion paper sheet above the picture there to make it even more obscure. It's very, uh, it has not been yet discovered exactly what it is. Uh, it seems to be maybe a painter in front of a canvas with the model, but there you need really to have faith in me to see it, <laughs> because it's not very evident. It's not very uh, evident. And it's a private collection, so it's not so easy. Uh, here we have, uh, in this museum, <coughs> few of his still life, uh, where well you could see that. The other big subject of saint is, again, the assumption, huh? like we had in Joliet. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's hard to photograph. I don't have too good uh, uh, photograph of this. I, I wish I had once uh, somebody in the, in the room here who says, I will bring you a real photograph. But, but uh, anyway, it, it, it can give us an idea, and, and especially to maybe to encourage you to see the real thing and to, to go to, to see it. So it's, the again, the Virgin Mary uh, brought to heaven and encircled by angels, some of them with musical instruments, like uh, I think you see, you see a, a kind of lira, and they are kind of guitar, and they have also a piece of paper in which I would, I would imagine that the music is written. And here in the corner, you have a profile uh, that we will find as well. You see, for instance, this woman here is also uh, ap appearing as the head of an angel somewhere in the church, and in fact, we know who she is. She was a cousin of Le Duc. And she married Luigi Capello, the first teacher of Le Duc, who is quite close. Huh? It's very mysterious, the relationship of Le Duc with Madame Capello. Huh? Because at a certain moment, Capello turned um, a little bit crazy. He, he went to France and become completely mystical and all that. And he's not yet dead. And uh, then you see in the, uh, the announcement of the time that Madame Capelli, verve, widow. Huh? So maybe it has helped the relationship. I don't know what was the idea. But finally, when the, the old Capelli died, they got married and, they, and this uh, Le Duc lived with this woman all his life. The, the end of the Virgin is based on the, uh, I would say, the figure of his sister, Ozena. Huh? Uh, they have one of the uh, incredible name in this family, uh, Ozias, Ozema. <laughs> it's not, not a very common name, but anyway. And this girl was called Ozema. And you see here, uh, in fact, he wrote on it, Ressemblance de Massa, Ozema. So there's, uh, there's no problem with that. And then he transformed her with a long hair and all that. And he used uh, this face here for uh, the face of, of the Virgin Mary. Here is Ozema, if you want. This is a photograph of her. This is another painting he made of her as a reader, uh, if you want. And uh, it's a beautiful figure of absorption. Uh, re the reading, when, when you show somebody being uh, in the process of reading, you are creating a kind of distance with the spectator. You, you look at it, but he's not aware of your presence. He's so absorbed in what he's doing that it creates a distance like that. And it affirms, in a way, a kind of surface in which uh, that locked the picture inside of itself. I'm quoting more or less from memory uh, Mike, famous Michael Fried, uh, analysis of this type of absorption picture. Uh, here it's uh, also a uh, reading uh, less flattering, you see she has a really uh, quite a big nose there. <laughs> this, this should, uh, but but uh, again, this is so typical of him to take, uh, I want to show you this bridge between his painting, say the, these two styles, because he, that's exactly the, the, way, the way he was working. Huh? Then what we can do is to try to show, uh, I would do it rapidly because really the, the picture I have are very bad, are, are not, uh, are old in a way and has turned blue with the time. I'm told that with Photoshop I can make miracle, but I don't know how to do it. So, uh, so what is the, here you have a plan of the church and with little numbers, and around it, let's say, you have the team, the main team that uh, uh, 
the Duke have uh, exploited there. And the main theme is the sacrament. But the way you treat them, it's through the gospel. So for instance, baptism will be alluded, like here, by the baptism of, of Christ, as it's told in the, in the Bible. Uh, you see St. John the Baptist and Christ. And uh, the Jordan River is reduced to almost nothing. But what is more peculiar, in the back you have some maple tree, and you have the Mont saint in the back. <laughs> so, so he has uh, put, let's say, the... Uh, the famous scene in a kind of more familiar type of surrounding. And this, I would say, the baptism will correspond to 14 here somewhere, if you are in the church. So if you go from one uh, number to the other, say, for instance, I wanted to show you how you make the most of you, know, you, you see it here, and uh, this is a, li a little painting of the, the uh, house of the ferryman, is beautiful in which because you see we are on one side of the Richelieu, we see the wall set in air on the other side with the loaf of bread, and there you see the light coming to this little house there and uh, in early in the morning, and this is of course the ferry that they were using at the time to cross before they built the bridge in saint Hilaire. So you, you, we can then again not make a, a relationship between landscape and religious painting of Le Duc. Uh, this idea of making the sacrament as a team, uh, uh, it's a relatively rare type of iconographic uh, uh, subject. Uh, one who has done it before is Poussin. Uh, when Poussin have made two series of these paintings in which you have uh, uh, the, the, the seven sacraments, but let's say I took two, two examples to show you a little bit how it looks. The uh, ear of the baptism, and you see it's much more elaborated than what Ludwig did, of course, with many personages and all this. And here it is the uh, ordination, is the delivery of the keys to Peter. Uh, this is a scene where uh, Jesus says, uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Uh, you remember this, uh, this phrase. And uh, so if, if we continue with this key in hand, let's say, in 13, you will have uh, Jesus in the house of Simon, but then you have to go back to, the, to your gospel to know what is the connection here you know, with sacrament. Huh? Well, it is uh, Mary Magdalena, who is very famous now that everybody has read the, the Da Vinci Code. And <laughs> I will not go into this. But, uh, okay, so then, of course, it's the penance, huh? uh, the sacrament of, of uh, penance that is alluded there because of this, uh, the presence of, my, of Mary Magdalena there. Uh, if you go a little bit further, you will have uh, in 12 here the uh, supper at Emmaus, although then it will be the Eucharist, of course, uh, the, the, the communion, if you want. Uh, further, you have the Pentecost, I think this is in 9, it's here. Okay, the two numbers that I skipped here are devoted to the evangelist. Uh, there's two on one side, two on the other side, so St. Luke and St. Mark and St. Matthew and St. John. And uh, so then, after, in mind, you have the Pentecost, so then, I don't know if you remember what, what is the connection with, uh, with sacrament. It is a confirmation. Uh, it's a kind of a, the bar mitzvah of the Christian, of the Catholic, let's say. And uh, then here on 8, uh, you have the death of St. Joseph, so that's go with extreme unction, of course, I could imagine. And then you go up there, on the five, I think, yeah, you have the two, two evangelists, and then on five you have a representation of uh, Jesus giving the key to the delivery, let's say, the keys to Peter. And if you follow his gesture, you will see that the, there is a, a rock in the, in, the, in the back there. And this is Saint Hilaire, of course, again. This is what we call the, uh, the cliff of Saint Hilaire, so the Dieppe uh, cliff there. And uh, again, it's a kind of allusion to, to the landscape that he knew. Uh, about this one, we know uh, two uh, studies that he made in Paris. Uh, one of them is even indicated like this, because when he decided to make this, uh, this uh, decoration in saint -Hilaire, he decided that he, he needed to go to Paris to have model and to have people posing for him. Uh, and uh, that was not, there was not too many in St. Hilaire itself, and even in Montreal at the time. So he, 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 he went there. And here, it's exactly the same 
team. Uh, it's St. Peter and tries giving him the keys and all that. But uh, as you see, he decided to do it otherwise, uh, finally, when he was here. Uh, he didn't follow exactly uh, the same type of presentation. And finally, here, of course, in four, this little circle there is where the pulpit is. So uh, then you cannot put uh, any painting there. And so finally, in three, you have the marriage of the Virgin Four. You could guess it, uh, the marriage, uh, sac the sacrament of marriage. Uh, so it's a, like I tell you, it's a kind of a, a not so frequent type of iconography. Again, very simple, very uh, clear, if you want. A little bit like in Joliet, was based on the rosary. This one is based on, on the uh, seven sacrament. In St. Emilial of Farnham, the church I want to show you now, the, uh, the intricacy of the iconographic program is much more complicated, and I will not be able really to go in detail in that. Uh, let's see, this is the, the main altar, and you have here the sermon on the mouth, let's see, on the top there in the circle, and then behind all this uh, complicated sculpture, you have a theme like the glorification of the cross. I don't know if you see it. You have the cross there. And then all these rays uh, going in every direction, and with God the Father is on the top. I should do this kind of thing. So, who was the, the, the vicar of this new parish in Saint Louis? Monsieur Laflamme. Uh, the same guy, he finished with Saint Hilaire, and then he was named in Saint Romuald, and he remembered that uh, Josias Sadik did work for him then, and he hired him again. Uh, so, uh, uh, but what happened in Saint Romuald, apparently, the uh, there was a restoration done in the 60s. I should not name the guy. I know his name. <laughs> and he, he, apparently it was not well done. See, what happened if a, a restorer come in, in a church like that and he paint what is there, and it's especially with oil, it's very difficult to remove it and to, without uh, uh, making, uh, ruining what is behind. Huh? And so some, and so they, I know that the church had made three expertise the different, at different times, and they asked from the Commission of uh, Historical Monument to get some money for, for restoring the church. They didn't get it yet. They were asking something like seventy or to $80,000, so I guess it's a, it's a big amount of money. But again, this is a church completely decorated by Rosia Duke and could be uh, worthwhile to save. What I can show you is some, uh, a, one example, let's see, of a drawing preparatory to one of the decor that you have there. And the theme, again, is a very, very uh, uh, Catholic, a very, uh, it's a coronation of the, of the Virgin in heaven, you see. Not only she, she has the assumption to go there, but then she gets a crown from uh, Jesus himself with the triangle behind with the Trinity, of her, the, the, the symbol of Trinity, and the uh, Le Duc explained that he wanted to put here in the back a kind of rainbow. Uh, and the rainbow traditionally, again, is a sign of hope. You remember the story of the flood when the, the, the water recedes, then suddenly uh, the, the Bible says that the, the bow uh, appear in the heaven of this, the rainbow, and then God says, I will never make trouble like this like I did. Uh, you will not, not anymore have a flood. We will destroy all the animals and things. He, he seems to be peevish and he says, oh, yeah, I'm sorry to have made so much mess. And, the, and he, he tells the, the people, this, each time you see the rainbow, it will be the sign that I will... I will. So for, for Le Duc, the, 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 always when you, 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 you go in, in his writing and all that, it's always this. He always does this uh, interest in symbolism like this. If I can find something that means hope, okay, it's perfect. I put it in my painting. Uh, and uh, the other thing, uh, so uh, you see how you, uh, you t uh, this is the preparatory drawing, or this is a photo done before the restoration, so it gives you an idea how it looks in the church. Uh, it's like above one of the side altar. When you face, in, uh, when you enter in the church on the left, you have a little altar. You have the main altar in the middle, but you have two on each side, and it's one of the, uh, the team above the one on the left. And uh, the other team that he treated was the only family. You remember how important it was in New France and all that? Again, it, 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 it resists. So he had two choices. Or this one on the right that he used in Joliet, where it shows the... Uh, a kind of uh, little studio you see with Joseph and and uh, wow wonder uh, uh, Jesus
Jesus to just uh, discover the shape of the cross you know, and, and make it. And uh, of course, the, the Virgin Mary is a perfect example of what a woman should do, so just uh, sewing and sewing and sewing. And here, in the contrary, it's a more, um, I would say, kind of more mystical type of, uh, of uh, presentation, since they are seemingly floating in mid -air like this. And you have, again, the theme of the Trinity. Huh? You remember the, the vertical Trinity and the horizontal one that I showed you last time? And in here, well, God the Father is reduced to one finger, let's say, to a hand. Here you have the Holy Ghost and finally Jesus. And on each side, of course, you have... Uh, uh, St. Joseph and, and the Virgin Mary. And, and here in this picture, he put a um, uh, kind of uh, peasant, let's say, praying as if they, were, they had an apprenticeship. And I, I think this is a good example of what I was saying in the beginning, this humanization of the divine you know, on the right, and then in the country, the divination of the human, uh, to, to put it more mysterious and more strange. And this is, a, the one on the left is the solution that he used uh, in Farnham. Uh, fourth example, it's in the, uh, in Sherbrooke, and this is a chapel that was done for the bishop of, of Sherbrooke. And uh, of course then, uh, see, you go to Sherbrooke, you have a huge church, it's called Saint Michel de, de Sherbrooke, and then on the side, you have the uh, archbishopry. And it's there that you have to go. Don't go in the big church, go <laughs> on, the, on the right side. And there it's a little chapel for the usage only of the bishop and few priests, let's say. So it's very small. But what is so fantastic there, the, everything there has been done by Osias I mean, uh, the, all the paintings there, even the decoration around the painting. And it's one also one of the first projects where Bordeaux was uh, with Le Duc. Uh, and of course, Bordeaux was 17 uh, at the time, and he didn't paint uh, important pieces there. But uh, uh, you, you have in the journal of Le Duc uh, indication like this. I asked Pauline to paint the leaves in the tree. Okay, so a leaf in the tree was done with a, with a stencil. If you want, it's not too hard to do. You put a stencil, and you just go like this, and then you... you he plays them and you make another one and another one. So he, he, he had uh, Bordeaux making kind of familiar jobs like this, but nevertheless, it was one of their first contributions. And I guess also for Bordeaux, it was one of the first um, perception of what our teaching could be, uh, because it was really a relationship between a master and an apprentice, unlike in the old days. And then when we will go after that to the Ecole de Fine Arts, uh, the Fine Arts School here, you will find it less interesting because then in the school you are many people and you have a teacher who teach you. You don't have anymore this kind of uh, very personal type of, uh, of relationship. Huh? And, and Le Duc also was more or less uh, uh, surveying his pupils. Eh? J'ai donné une leçon d'histoire de l'art le soir à Polyville. Uh, that Polyville would not go in the evening to, to see girls and things like that. No, no. He, he, he gave him from time to time a little uh, history, uh, art, art history lesson. So what I can show you there, because it's very difficult, again, to photograph the real thing, it is, again, preparatory drawings for this decoration at Sh in Sherbrooke. Uh, and these drawings are all at the National Gallery now in Ottawa, but, but let's see, they give us a good idea of uh, what Ludwig wanted to do. Here is a very complicated theme. I think because he was in a bishopry, and it was a kind of private chapel of the bishop, he indulged in a complicated type of uh, iconography. Uh, it, it's supposed to represent the Virgin as the co-redeemer, uh, or should we say co-redeemer? Uh, uh, I don't know. But, uh, and uh, so she's represented on this, uh, uh, cr the crescent of the moon there, and habitually, this is a sign that you are dealing with the Immaculate Conception. When you have the little moon there, it's not the Assumption. Huh? The Assumption, she will be just floating in midair. But if she's like this, that means it's the Immaculate Conception. And then she's asso associated here with Adam and Eve huh? uh, that you see in the bottom. They are already partly dressed, let's say. And you see the famous serpent there huh? around the tree. So the tree there is the, the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. You have again the rainbow uh, with the hope of uh, getting out of this mess that our first uh, parents uh, put, put us in. 
And then on the top, uh, you have uh, this, uh, uh, Ledeck always indulge in this kind of symbolism. You have a circle that for him very often represent eternity. You have a scale for justice. And you have this kind of uh, real pool there of, of the creation. Anyway, and then these two angels there will own inscription that will come from the Bible and complete the, the, the representation. So this is the first painting in this chapel. Then we have another one where the theme is more familiar, except that it's not represented as, as we, we see it habitually. The Annunciation, okay, you have the angel Gabriel who come and tell her that he, you will be the, the mother of God, and the Virgin is there. And behind, this is according to Le Duc uh, Bethlehem. He was never in Bethlehem. <laughs> I know that doesn't look like this, but anyway, it's a kind of... Uh, uh, and then behind here, all these vertical things that you see, are there are four of them. These are the representation of the four um, sources of water that are mentioned in, in the Genesis at the very beginning uh, of these four uh, rivers. Like you have the Tigris, I think, the Euphrates, and two others who are, nobody found them, the Fison and the Gihon. So, uh, again, this could be related to baptism also, this, uh, this allusion there. And again, the same type of representation, plus on the top, a symbol, the circle for eternity, the cross, and the Holy Ghost uh, with, uh, in the shape of a bow. Uh, third one, this is the uh, Jesus among the doctor. You see the Jesus here with the doctor while put in the dark, he says, uh, because uh, they have discussion. And then in the forefront, of course, uh, the parents who are very worried about this kid who doesn't appear when he should. And uh, in the, on the top, you have the symbol of the Trinity with the triangle and the cross, and always the same type of uh, presentation, the two angels and the inscription. Uh, and finally, a crucifixion. Uh, were also, in a way, quite traditional with the Virgin and St. John and Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. Here you have a skull, and habitually in the iconography, the skull there is Adam, uh, is the skull of Adam, as if the redemption that's taking place there is to save uh, our race. And you see, indeed, you have the serpent against there. Yeah? I don't know if you see it there, with all these uh, spare uh, aimed at him. Yeah. And uh, in the top, the hand of God and the kind of laurel, uh, a crown of laurel. Uh, here may be the entrance of the Saint Sepulchre uh, that is shown on the right uh, there. So it's a really well thought and quite complicated type of uh, iconography that Le Duc thought that he could indulge in because it was a kind of private uh, chapel and it uh, was more difficult to access. I will finish my presentation with the last project that uh, uh, Le Duc did in a, in a place called Notre Dame de la Présentation in Shawinigan. Nothing to do with our ex-Prime Minister, but, <laughs> but it's a fact that in, in Shawinigan South, you have this church who's not very uh, appealing, a little bit uh, big, ugly, and all that, in which uh, uh, Le Duc had a, a, f a fantastic contract, and he was 76 years old when he started this work, and he, he worked on that up to his death, in fact. Uh, he was always a small uh, painter, always very uh, meticulous and all that. So when he went there, that's what it looked inside. Huh? Uh, it was empty, uh, ugly, and all that, so with these, these statues in plaster everywhere, and, and this kind of huge space there, empty completely. And when you go there now, after his work, it's very striking, the difference between the two. So he suppressed the little uh, niche that were there, and he painted all the whole background there is absolutely fantastic. It's a huge, huge space. Uh, you can you imagine as big as what you see in front of, of you. And the theme there, uh, I can show it to you with, with this drawing because it's clear, uh, let's see. The theme there is again the Trinity. Uh, you have God the Father, you have the Holy Ghost, and you have Christ on the cross here. And on each side, he have put two, I would say, that this is quite typical also of, the, of this iconography. You find scenes in the Old Testament that could announce the New Testament, that could make a kind of a relationship with it. Huh? And, uh, but the rest, all this here, besides, is completely abstract. It's like if you look just at these 
side here, you have the impression of the being in front of an abstract painting. Uh, and he, 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 this was a, a kind of the major work in that church, this, this background there, this, uh, what you see there. And this is, let's say, two uh, sketches of the two scenes on each side. Uh, uh, you see, this is the one here, and the, uh, there's another one there. So in this case, it is the Melchizedek offering. So what it is, why they put that? Because if you read again the Genesis on this, you will see that the offering was from bread and wine. And of course, then right away, the uh, let's say the Christian doctors at the time saw a relationship with the, uh, with the communion, with the Eucharist. And on the other side is the more traditional scene also of uh, Abraham and, and, and Isaac, uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, who has always been... Uh, and put in parallel with the, the death of Christ. Uh, so you put that on each side, and then in the middle, this, this trinity. But what is more even astonishing is the rest of the decoration. If you go in the, if you go in the church, not what we see when we enter, but if you look on the side, you have this representation of the people of the region, uh, in a way. And he chose four uh, main uh, subject that could be close to the to the people. For instance, certainly the lumberjack, because you are in the north and you have a lot of wood there, and also, as you know, one of the big industry of Shawinigan is paper. Uh, so wood will make sense there. And so he made um, a kind of, uh, I, I thought always that the, the harm of this guy is a little bit long, but, <laughs> but, but maybe he's in the swing. <laughs> Cutting the tree so we need it. But uh, anyway, it, it's the, number, the the settler, if you want. And on the top, you have all the instruments that he will use when the forest will be destroyed. Huh? You will need a, a plow and uh, and this instrument, I don't know what is the name. Uh, in French, we say the uh, S uh, to, to clean the, the land. And also, even here, this is the, the uh, thing you put on, on when you have a bull. How do you call it? A yoke, yeah, yeah, exactly. So he put uh, 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 on the top, let's say, what, what these people hope to, to, to use. Uh, when they will finish with the forest, they will be able to transform it. Uh, and then the second scene is about the sorrow, uh, which again, it's uh, typical, but there he could make a relation with some religious symbol like uh, wine and wheat, and then, of course, the, the Eucharist. Uh. With the sorrow, he was closer to his... Uh, to a subject, but it's astonishing to see that in a church, huh? because you could expect a scene like that done, uh, let's see, in the context of a museum or something, but it's really uh, the four main painting in the, on the side, in, uh, in the transept, you see these, uh, these scenes uh, coming from, uh, I would say, uh, everyday life. Huh? Then he went to subjects who are more specific to the place, like I think is what we call a Grindel's loader. These people are pulling logs of wood in a machine that will uh, transform the wood in pulp, uh, and then will be used to make paper. And of course then right away, what paper will mean in terms of religion, of course the Bible. Uh, so you put a Bible here, a print, uh, uh, a printing uh, machine, and on the other side, I think it's pa papyrus. Have you see the, the papyrus? I think it's that. Uh, well, the first form of paper, if you want, uh, in the antiquity. Huh? And finally, the uh, the last scene I have, uh, I will show you how we proceed. It's about al aluminium, huh? because this is another aspect of the region, of course, metal smelter, and you see them; they they are uh, working here. And he had even uh, Monsieur Nadeau there to pose for him in two photos to, sh to see exactly how they work. But he didn't take, in one of his sketches, you could find a relation between, but not in the final painting. And one thing he didn't do and he didn't understand, when you pour metal like that, you better use a pad like the, this guy is using, you see, because you will burn yourself completely. This is very hot things, and that's why they are dressed like this, like the big, uh, the big metal. So they have, you see, where we use your almost uh, naked hand and all this. Well, he took some liberty. And then on the top, well, you have metal things. You have a lamp, you have an anvil here, and you have a lira on this side. I don't know if it's a... But, but then you could say in the, this project of humanization of religion, I think this is the, the way he went further. Uh, when he 
put in the church things w- w- will be in a way to, to give meaning and to give uh, a certain transcendence to these uh, quotidian gestures uh, of these people. And the parish Notre Dame de la Présentation is a worker parish. It's a, a rather kind of poor uh, area of Shawinigan, and uh, in which uh, suddenly, well, they, they, they are presented like this, the people were proud of this. Now they, they have transformed the church as a kind of, I would say, almost a touristic uh, uh, spot. You could visit it, and it's well, well explained, organized, and everything. Uh, that uh, probably one of the rare uh, uh, things of that nature in, in this uh, surrounding. And so when you, you reflect about his, his um, commitment to this type of themes, you see that uh, this is exactly w- one of the, I would say, the difficulty of this iconography, to, to bring some uh, true symbolism, to bring some uh, perception, let's say, of another world, but on the other hand also to humanize all this, to bring it closer to us. Huh? but not so much close that you will lose this transcendence. Huh? This, and this is very typical of, it's one of the big issues of Christian iconography. Yeah? Because as I told you, I think in the beginning of this dogma of the incarnation and the, the sacrifice of Christ and all that, it, it's so linked to that, that we, I would say all the way, we had always this type of uh, unbalance between the two sides and how to really solve the problem. So I, I guess this is a, one of the major um, examples that we have here in, in Canadian art with this uh, wonderful man, Monsieur Seduc. Okay, with this, I finish my presentation of uh, too much Christian <laughs> things. Next time, we will deal with the group of seven a little bit, so it will, it will change our, our mood on this. Uh, sometimes I have the feeling I'm like a preacher, you know, like, like a, a vicar. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we'll do with uh, a little bit with the group of seven, but, uh, with theosophy and uh, well, the Harris, and, uh, you, could, you could imagine. Thank you. Okay.